Hello and welcome to the presentation for um, the poem that we're going to be looking at in detail for this lesson. Oh, my love is like a red, red rose. And we are looking at this poem as, as a way to practice our poetry analysis as part of our Does Love Make the World Go Round unit. So remember with our unit, one of the questions that we are exploring at the moment is what are the conventions of love poetry? So in this lesson, we are thinking about the conventions of love poetry. And remember in the previous lessons, we talked about conventions being things like the qualities, the ingredients, uh, the features. So we're thinking about does love poetry in particular have uh, features that we can find across all sorts of love poetry. So in this lesson, I'm going to go through a poem with you and to show you how I would identify the conventions of the love poetry, in particular the love poem that we're looking at today, and how I would go about answering some of the key questions so that then you can do the same thing with two other poems. So for this lesson, remember you need your student work booklet. Most of you will, or all of you, will need the Conventions of Love Poetry white booklet. And some of you will also need the green one. So please make sure you have those with you. So let's recap. When we are thinking through poetry, we're thinking about the purpose. That's the first thing we consider. We look at the poem, we read through it, and then we stop and think about why has this poem been written? What is the purpose that the poet is seeking to achieve here? And one way to help us think through that is to look at the title of the poem. After we've looked at the purpose, we want to look at the message. We want to think about what is the poet wanting to communicate to their audience and to us? What are they saying? And when we work through those two aspects, we write them down and we have them right in front of us at the top of the poem even to help us to really um, think through other aspects of the poem. And when we have the purpose and the message clear in our minds, it really helps us to understand the poem in more depth. We also think about the language, the types of words that have been used by the poet, words that may be emotive, that have negative or positive connotations, um, any words that are really strong, um, even words that convey doubt or uncertainty. We also think about the form. We look at how the poet has structured their poem. Have they used stanzas? Have they used rhyme? Have they used rhythm and metre? Have they used uh, the punctuation to, to structure their writing? And often they'll choose the right form to fit the message, the ideas. And lastly, we think about the features of the poem. What specific features has the poet used to really emphasise their ideas? Similes, metaphors, personification, sound devices like onomatopoeia or alliteration. These sorts of aspects of poetry are really key in helping us to see what the poet is doing to really create an effect on the reader. Now the poem that we are looking at today is written by Robert Burns, who was living in the late 1700s. He was a celebrated Scottish poet. He is considered today to be the national poet of Scotland. So we can get that sense that he is um, really a poet that is um, held in high esteem. Uh, particularly because of the way that he uh, sought to preserve the Scottish culture and heritage in the way that he wrote his poetry. In particular, he wrote his poetry in the Scottish vernacular, um, which meant that he used the language and the 
the dialect spoken by the ordinary people. And at a time when the Scottish people were feeling like their culture and their heritage and their language was being quashed by a lot of their English um, culture, this was something that seemed to be really important at the time. So when we look at this poem, we want to remember that this poem is about Burns depicting a love that is both fresh and lasting. So keep that idea at the front of your mind. So make sure you have turned to this page, page four, that, so that you've got the poem in front of you. And let's um, have a read through of the poem. A red, red rose. Oh, my love is like a red, red rose that's newly sprung in June. Oh, my love is like the melody that sweetly played in tune. So fair art thou, my bonny lass, so deep in love am I, and I will love thee still, my dear, till a seas gang dry. Till all the seas gang dry, my dear, and the rocks melt with the sun. I will love thee still, my dear, while the sands our life shall run. And fare thee well, my only love, and fare thee well a while, and I will come again, my love, though it were ten thousand miles. Okay, so as we work through this poem, make sure you have the um, activity sheet in front of you as well. Have both pages open so that you can see the questions on the left hand side and also see the um, boxes that I would like you to fill in as we work through this poem. Make sure that you take note that I am providing you with some information to as part of what you need to write and you need to finish off those sentences. And so I'm trying to show you how I would answer these questions and my thinking um, behind how I would get these answers. So I'm really trying to model for you how to do this sort of activity. So all I want you to, to do is to follow along and to fill in the the details in your workbook when you need to. Okay, so now that we've read through the poem and we've got an idea of what it's about, it's not really that difficult as you can see. And some of those words that may look uh, unusual, uh, they're not really familiar, or they have some funny spellings, or you can see some of the words don't seem to be all that complete. Um, make sure you look at the notes at the bottom of the page in the pink box and that will give you a glossary of what those words mean. You can, once you start to read through, you'll get a sense that the words are really just um, how they would have been spelt or pronounced during that time. And there are some words where he has uh, imitated the accent uh, of the Scots and also to fit the rhyme and the rhythm he has contracted or shortened the words. So firstly, if you remember, we are looking at the purpose of the poem and we are looking at why the poet has written this poem. And we can see that the purpose of the poem is to communicate to his beloved um, and to us um, his his love. He's also in a way trying to persuade or even to convince his audience, his love, um, that he, his love will be forever. So you can write that down in the box. 
we also look at the message. Uh, what is the poet's message? And if you remember, when we talk about things like this, we want to be specific. So yes, we know that he is talking about his love. Uh, that is fairly clear. Um, he's repeated it numerous times, but let's try and be more specific. Uh, let's try and develop that idea a bit more. So when we're thinking about the poet's message and we're trying to really think about, well, what is he wanting to tell us about his love? Let me go back to the ideas that I uh, introduced you to at the beginning of this presentation, that his love is um, something special and it's unique. Um, so we think about this in terms of some of these key lines. So when he says, oh, my love is like a red, red rose that's newly sprung in June, we get the idea that his love is fresh. And then later when he says, I will love thee still, my dear, we also get this idea that it is lasting. It's going to be forever or it's unconditional. No matter what, he will always love her. So now we can see that this is his message. His love is fresh and lasting. So you can write that down in your box. Now our first question is, what literary device does Burns use here? Explain the imagery of this line. So this is a two part question. You need to identify the literary device and then we need to explain what image this literary device creates. So I'm going to go through some of my thinking for this. So you can see that the literary device that he uses is a simile. We know that it's a simile because of the word like, and we also know it's a simile because he's making a comparison. He has, the subject is his love, and he's comparing his love to that of a rose. So part of that, my thinking is when I look at similes, I think about what is the, the, the subject of the comparison and then what is he comparing it to? Then we want to explain the imagery. So this means that we need to take our ideas a little bit further. So when I think about the image, I, need, I think about the rose and I want to consider what is he saying about a rose to then understand what is he saying about his love. So he, he, the rose is that we learn, the rose is bright red and we know that because of the way that he's repeated the word red. He could have just said, my love is like a red rose, but there's something about repeating the word red that draws our attention and also signifies to us that it's it's bright, it's new. So we can see that it's new, it's intense, and it's passionate. So that's one idea about the rose. Another idea is that it has just opened and we can see that from the newly sprung phrase he's got here. So this gives us the idea that the rose is new, it's fresh, and it's also young. So this is what he's saying about the rose. So when he's saying that his love is like a rose, then we can say that he's saying that his love could be new, intense, passionate, fresh, and young. So when we answer this question, the question is asking us explain the imagery of this line then you can see right well this is will help me with my answer so when i think about crafting my answer i can say something like this through comparing his love to a red and newly opened rose burns is describing his love as intense and new so you can see here that i've outlined that he's comparing his love to something. He's comparing his love to a, ro to a red and newly opened rose. I haven't just said that he's comparing his love to a rose. I've tried to be a little bit more detailed by saying what the rose is like. And then I'm saying that he, what is the image? The image is that he's 
describing his love as intense and new. So you can see through working out these ideas in my thinking, it has helped me to answer that question. All right, let's move on. Question four, what does this archaic second person pronoun suggest about the audience of this poem? Now, if you remember um, in the glossary in your booklets, the archaic uh, second person pronoun are words like thou, thy, thine, thy. When we're talking about second person, we're talking about when the, the writer is talking directly to their audience. So second person is when someone says, could you please stop that? Or do you understand? He could have said, so fair art are you, but he's used thou. So this can give us some ideas about the audience. Now, if you remember, archaic means old. It's an old way of referring to someone. It's also, if you remember talking about this in class, um, it also suggests a relationship with someone. So when you using thou, thy and thine, you are indicating a informal um, and also intimate um, relationship with that person. You would talk to your friends and your family members in that way. If you're talking to someone in a position of authority where you're trying to show respect, you would speak formally and that would be the you and the your. So just understanding that aspect of the second person and the archaic second person will help us to have a little bit more insight into the audience. So this is my thinking. Thou is an old term for you. The audience is from a different historical setting. It was still used in parts of Scotland and Northern England at the time of this, uh, the writing of this poem. And, you know, in fact, it's actually still used today in parts of uh, Northern England and Scotland. So we can assume that the audience is probably Scottish as well. Um, and we also know that with the thou, it's an informal way of addressing someone. So we can then assume that the speaker is close or intimate with the audience. So this is my thinking about the word thou. So how can I answer this question? This is what I've said. The archaic second person pronoun suggests that the audience is from an older time, but is on intimate terms with the speaker. So you can see that in my answer, I have um, included the question, the archaic second person pronoun suggests that the audience, and then I've included my answer. Um, I made reference to the fact that it, that the poem is set in the past. It's from a different historical period to our own. But I wanted to emphasize the fact that I think that the use of the archaic second person pronoun suggests that they are intimate with each other, where they can address each other in that informal way. So if you want to pause and write this answer down, you can do that now. OK, let's move on. Question five, explain what Burns is suggesting about time and love. So let's look at these lines here. And I will love thee still, my dear, to all the seas gang dry. To all the seas gang dry, my dear, and the rocks melt with the sun. I will love thee still, my dear, while the sands of life shall run. Thinking about these lines, till all the seas go dry, to all the seas go dry, my dear, and the rocks melt with the sun. So we can see that Burns is making some sort of connection between time and love. He's saying that I will love you until the seas dry and until the rocks melt with the sun. So let's think about this a bit more. 
The speaker says that he will love these still until all the seas dry up and the rocks melt with the sun. We know that this won't happen anytime soon. It sounds a little bit strange. So what does he mean by that? So I think he must be referring to a long time away or even the end of the world when the earth will um, come to, a, to an end where creation will cease to exist. So is he saying then that he will love her until the end of time? Does this indicate to us that his love is everlasting? Perhaps he's saying that his love will exist beyond the barriers of time. And we know that that uh, it makes reference to the idea that his love is transcendent. So that's how I've thought about that question. This is my answer. The speaker comments that his love will last through until the end of time, till all the seas gang dry. Burns is suggesting that love can exist beyond time, that it is transcendent. So with this answer, in order to answer it in effective detail, I have written it in two sentences and I've included a quotation. And this helps to show that I really have understood the question and I'm demonstrating that I have a good understanding through the detail. So I have said that his love will last through until the end of time. So this is what he's saying in the poem. And then through answering that in this second sentence, I'm saying that this is what he's suggesting. So this is what he's saying in the first sentence. And then I've added, well, he is suggesting that his love can exist beyond time. So the second sentence is offering an interpretation of what is written in the poem. So when you get a question about explain an idea in the poem, you talk about where the idea exists in the poem and you explain what, it, uh, what it's saying and then you offer an interpretation. So what is the poet trying to say about this idea? So see if you can develop your ideas a little bit more. And by doing your thinking, it helps you to unpack your ideas so that you can explain the question in more detail. So with my thinking, I've tried to show you that I've tried to look for the ideas and I've tried to, to sort of explain what those phrases mean and then think, well, this is what he's saying. The seas dry up, the rocks melt. What does that actually mean? And so you can see my third dot point, I've tried to unpack what that actually might mean. What is he trying to say? So a lot of your analysis of poetry is just trying to think through what the poet is trying to say in their lines. And they're doing it often figuratively and metaphorically because they actually want you to stop and think. They do it on purpose. So it's almost a mental game. And so the poet wants you to play this mental game with them. So you try and play that game too and you think through those ideas. So you can now pause if you want and I'd like you to write this answer down in the box. Okay, so it's time for you to work on the next poem and you can choose to do this on your own or I'd like you to do it in small groups. I, I would like you to do it in groups of two or three. Please don't do any more than three. Um, you'll be allocated one of the two poems. So because um, I'm doing this through a presentation, I would like you all to work through the first um, poem that comes next in the booklet. In your small groups or on your own, I'd like you to read aloud the poem. It's really important for your understanding of the poetry that you read it aloud. You need to hear it, you need to hear how it sounds because that has as much impact on the meaning as the imagery. I want you to identify the purpose of the poem, 
and I want you to summarize the messages the writer is trying to convey, just like I did with this poem, The Red, Red Rose. I want you to answer the blue box questions. If you're working in groups, allocate the questions to each group member. So if you're in a group of three, you can divide the questions, the blue box questions, uh, divide them up between you. Um, if you are just working through the white booklet, please write your answers in your workbooks. If you've also got the green booklet, you can write your answers in the green booklet. So it's over to you now. Um, please start straight away. Don't spend too long organising your groups if you're working in groups. And um, I'd like to see what your answers are in our next lesson. Thank you.